Good afternoon. My name is David Ruddy and welcome to our webinar on crisis management for primary schools. You're all very welcome and I, I'm conscious that you may have just finished um, a day's work or have just stepped outside the office or indeed classroom or if you're a chairperson of a board or a member you have made yourself available so thank you for joining us in such large numbers. Mason Hayes and Kern is delighted to host this event in association with the CPSMA and in particular I would like to thank Seamus Small Conroy who is General Secretary of CPSMA for his support in relation to this webinar and also to Eno Herdehy um, who is head of our Mason Hayes and Kern education team of which I am a member. I'm joined on the panel this afternoon by Fergal Kelly uh, of CPSMA. Uh, Fergal works as an, as an advisor to school leaders and boards and also has served as a school principal. Uh, we are joined by Owen McDermott. Um, Owen is managing director of the communications clinic. Owen has worked with Mason Hayes solicitors and indeed the education team for the last decade. He's a member of a board of management himself. The communications clinic is an organization that specializes in strategic communications and crisis management. And last and by no means least um, is our own Edel Kennedy. Edel is a senior associate on our education team, and she is highly experienced in advising schools in relation to many issues. Some housekeeping notes, uh, because of the large number of registrants, uh, the chat function is, is now, uh, it's not enabled. Um, and uh, we will start off uh, with uh, a question for Fergal. So I suppose at the start, Fergal, schools are a microcosm of society. We have over 4,000 primary, post-primary schools and 1 million students throwing 100,000 staff and all the parents were so connected. But would you like to tell me what sort of crisis situations land uh, on your desk for support uh, with yourself and your colleagues? Of course, David. Uh, yeah, well, of course, Currently, uh, schools are in a long-term drawn-out crisis uh, where everything really has been turned on its head in education. Uh, we've seen where the best laid plans have been suddenly upended. Schools over the past year have had to get used to a very different context and where communication uh, with its stakeholders has, ne has never been more important. But I suppose one particular scenario that comes to mind that came to our office over the past few days was um, a scenario where a staff member uh, took ill and an ambulance was called to the school. Now, uh, one thing that's notable about that, I suppose, is once parents hear about that, us as parents were very single minded about threat. And if a parent feels that there is a threat, you know, in a school situation, they will come to the school naturally enough to take care of their child. But in this situation, due to the presence of an ambulance outside the school and the WhatsApps were going and everything else, uh, in this case, what the principal did was most effective. And it came in the form of speaking to parents by text. It was a quick, short, sharp message. A staff member has been taken ill, all the children are safe. So this in the form of that quick message conveyed everything that parents needed to know in one fell swoop. It also acknowledged the fear that parents were feeling. Now, obviously there was aftermath as well because the children were upset as the teacher was taken in ill and they would need support after all that. And staff of course were very upset as to what had happened to their colleague. So in that case, then staff need to be communicated with and confidentiality needs to be emphasized as we are still talking about the personal health of a colleague. So that is one example. But when I asked the principal what she would have done differently, and we're talking about a four or five uh, teacher school here in rural Ireland, which I suppose mirrors the situation of many of our schools. She said, well, just in that instance, I didn't know who to contact uh, in terms of the staff member's family. So I had to bear, I had to ask friends, and we once again had to bear in mind privacy here uh, if they had a phone number. So it might be something that you need to think about 
Um, just make sure that you have agreed contacts for all staff who work in your school in the event of a problem. It's one of those easy things that could be sourced now, and hopefully it won't be needed, but it just might be. And it's important to know that in a crisis, you know, we forget long messages. We watch how our leaders uh, behave. We really watch that intently. We believe that first message, it's all important. So getting that right is important. But in the absence of that first clear message, we can doubt the information and maybe rely on less reliable sources and forums for information. But I think we're going to deal with that later on as well. Thanks for that, Fergal. And um, you gave us a very practical example there. Own, I'm going to ask you a question. It's not, not an easy one, but what is a crisis? I'd start with a crisis is very stressful and that it's high risk. And at times it can be career defining. And for some really it can be, unfortunately, career ending. So in short, a crisis doesn't tend to be good. Where I work and my colleagues work, we tend to support organizations and school when media are on their way there or when social media is alive to a problem. And in a school setting that could range from accusations of bullying, racism, sexual harassment, uh, abuse of some kind, or God forbid, a, a, a tragedy. Outside of schools, our, our work tends to be with, could be sports people involved in altercations, well-known people being accused of taking illicit drugs. We supported an organization after its president was arrested by a foreign police force, for example. But I would tend, David, to split crises into two buckets. You have buckets of crises that you can kind of control and then you have a second bucket of the ones that you have lost direct control on. In both of those buckets, whichever one you're playing in, you as the principal or supporting the principal, your job is not to make it any worse. And you certainly don't want crises that are in bucket one, i.e. the ones that we can kind of control. We don't want them spilling into bucket two. So let's look at the type of examples that could be in bucket one. You could argue that a theft could go into bucket one because the, the way to deal with it is relatively clear. Or for example, God forbid that there is a tragedy or a death, the, the, the people you should be communicating with should be pretty clear to you, you should have a sense of it. Or for example, a situation that we've encountered a number of times where a former pupil might appear at the office to complain about how they were treated two decades ago. That would still be, I would argue, be relatively controllable, where the leader, the principal would have good empathy, good listening, apologizing might be enough. What you don't want to happen is something like that to spill into bucket two. And from our experience, mishandling of the one to one, mishandling of that human connection where a person complaining, for example, doesn't feel listened to or doesn't feel heard, that can lead them then, for example, to perhaps go to media or social media. So that's where you start to lose control. And that's when we're into bucket two. And that's where I tend to get called into situations where crises are about to catch the attention of media or social media. Part of the reason people in schools can, and organizations generally can find crises so stressful is a lack of familiarity with the situation and particularly the ones that could be making the news, there's a risk of losing face or damage to your reputation. So that again, creates huge anxiety. I would suggest after this call, building on what Fergal had touched on, what would make crises a little less stressful is an element of scenario planning. The types of crises you could face are predictable, not necessarily the timing of them, but the issues are relatively predictable. And so what I would ask you, do you know what you'll do? Do you have your team identified who could support you in the crisis? Is it, for example, going to be the chairman of the board, your deputy principal, who'll be there? Another thing that can be no harm to do is to share clearly and regularly with parents the complaints policy and avenues for them to complain well in advance of ever the needing to complain. Because again, from our experience, one of the reasons why people will go on social media is that they feel they have nowhere else to go with their issue or that their issue won't be listened to. So really from this, I'd suggest people think about the potential issues you could face, have an idea of the plan should one happen and identify the team who could support you. Thanks Owen for that and particularly the analogy about the two buckets and trying to keep everything in bucket one if possible.
Idel, um, can you give us a, a few examples of situations where um, the education team and yourself advise schools in relation to a, a crisis situation? Um, yes, David, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I should start off by saying that I, I'm going to give some examples that I would describe as being the more urgent crisis. But saying that, I recognise that uh, for each particular school, their own perception of what a crisis is is obviously subjective to them. So it might well be the parental complaints procedure that is, you know, never ending. Uh, it represents the crisis for that particular school. Uh, but I suppose just from our own perspective, the more urgent crisis that we have experienced in maybe in the last couple of months would have been a data breach uh, in which a, a principal inadvertently emailed highly sensitive uh, health data relating to another member of staff to a, a group of parents uh, and that and what was required in terms of notification of that data breach, what steps were taken in an effort to reduce the risk that that data breach posed, that was certainly a crisis for that particular school and how and in what way steps would be taken to try and remedy that breach. Um, another instance would be a school who contacted me regarding a teacher who was not wearing a face covering within the two meters of another child or other teachers in the school. And this had come to the principal's attention because another teacher had complained about it to the principal and said, you know, I'm, 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 I, I'm a vulnerable member of staff. I suffer from an underlying health condition. I, you know, I know so and so for many years, but I'm most concerned that she's not adhering to either the school's, you know, and the school's COVID policy or the own Department of Education guidance documents on the return to school. So that in that situation, that was a crisis in terms of the possibility for an outbreak, the situation whereby the principal, who when she tried to discuss the matter with the staff member in question, who was refusing to wear the face covering, uh, started, you know, objecting that she was being victimized on the basis of a, an underlying condition which she claims that she had and, and hadn't disclosed to us, I should add. Uh, but that in that situation represented a, a very real crisis for that particular school. So they're just two examples um, of, of recent incidents that have come across my desk. Thanks for that. And it does, it does go back to what Fergal um, said about, about COVID-19 and all the stress that has brought the general population, but in particular in, in schools. Um, the next question I have is for Fergal, and it's what is a critical incident policy, Fergal? Well, I, I suppose really, of course, uh, it's really important to put a critical incident plan in place in this scenario, uh, David, because, you know, we can plan and we can prepare. And when we're talking about schools, the stakes become much higher because we're dealing with children. Uh, but, you know, before that, schools who have already built up trust with their school communities and who have effective structures in place, they're already in a better position to deal with crises than others. Because a school with stable and connected leaders will weather a controversy more successfully than a school that has an adversarial relationship with its community. But back to the plan, um, it's really important to put a critical incident plan in place. Now on the Department of Education website, there is a link to a document called Responding to Critical Incidents, NEPS Guidelines and Resources for Schools, which provides you with guidelines how to construct a plan and what to be mindful of when drawing up a plan. Now, the main aims of the plan is to provide order to what can be a chaotic situation and to provide uh, support to the children and school personnel. But it also gives us who are involved, uh, are really involved in the situation, a first step in the event that something has happened. Now, in my own experience and in my own situation, it was the death of a child in the school notified to me as I'm driving to school. Now, all I can say in that situation is that it isn't easy to think clearly. Um, and, and Owen touched on this earlier, you really need to have a team of people who you can talk to. You know, if you're listening to this and you're a principal, uh, 
it might not even be you as principal that is dealing with this for various reasons. Um, and anyway, you, you might not uh, as simply, you can't control everything in this space. There's now a lot of decisions and actions that may need to happen within a pretty short space of time, or at least there is that kind of pressure on this situation. So there may be someone on your staff who is really good operationally, a really good organizer. So identify that person as somebody who will be practical and make good practical decisions. So look at the people you have around you and uh, assess the individual skills around you. Understand where the skills lie in the school. That might be your deputy principal, your chairperson, a member of the board, a teacher or an SNA in your school. And, you know, giving people something to do in the midst of a crisis has been found to have really beneficial effects for a school when dealing with a crisis, because it means people are productive and they're contributing in a positive way rather than feeling helpless and on the periphery. So I suppose for me, the learning from that situation was that it's important to brief staff at the earliest opportunity. Your staff are your greatest asset when dealing with a, a crisis. It's important to inform the chairperson of the board of management and board members of the event. The various liaison roles in the critical incident plan are crucial because they lay out uh, who speaks to the children, the materials, what you can use, who speaks to the family. So having the resources available there um, in a pack is really important. Um, there are excellent materials available on how to speak to the children in the resources attached uh, to that document. And uh, we've provided a link to this page on our website, uh, which it will be going live at the moment. Um, all the time in the school, what I found was routines should be kept as much as possible. And you'll get an opportunity to speak with a representative from NEPS. And in my experience, the response time was really fast. We were really grateful for their advice. So practically speaking, having that updated list of phone numbers for NEPS, local agencies, Department of Education, et cetera, was really important. So you didn't have to go searching. And yes, the plan is important, but you know, you might have to change your perspective if something isn't working and adjust things quickly, but that's sometimes the nature of these situations. So I suppose we're available in CPSMA. If something happens, please ring us, or if you have any um, queries around the formulation of the plan, please ring us in the CPSMA office. Thanks for that, Fergal. And if, if a school hasn't the opportunity to have done so already, the staff on board should be looking at their criti critical incident policy. There's a section in the critical incident policy um, in relation to communication on, and Fergal did say there, in a crisis situation, it's difficult to think clearly. So that piece in communication, what should it address? Well, the most, the most important- and, and, and all that. Yeah, David, the most important thing really in any communications, whether it's one-to-one -one communications, one-to-few, one-to-many, or the creation of a communications plan is the killer question of who are your key audiences or as Fergal has touched on, who are your key stakeholders? Fergal has touched on a number of them there within a school environment, really the members of the school community, your constituents, staff, students, parents, the board of management, perhaps the educational trust, to build on the example Adele made there, for example, around the data protection officer, they would suddenly become a stakeholder because an element of communication may need to happen with them within a particular time period. So it's always important that you have to have clarity on who your stakeholders are. Some of the principals that we have worked with, uh, myself and Mason Hayes and Corrin have worked with, have been initially surprised with the communications advice that we give. Because as I touched on at the start, we tend to get called in when media start calling. So the expectation often is that our advice is purely about media, but that it's not. I believe, you see, when, when media get involved, they often get a disproportionate amount of attention. Um, naturally, you could argue in some ways because of the very public nature of it. But the mistake people make in a crisis is that they believe media to be an audience when it's not. Media is a conduit. It's a channel to your audience. 
and so for example, Fergal cited the example of the school principal texting parents about the ambulance. I would argue the text message was a conduit to communicate a message to a very specific audience. That is crucially what you need to be reflecting on within a crisis. But the mistake that happens is once media call, all of our attention goes to it and we lose sight or people can lose sight of who their key stakeholders are. And in a crisis, you can never lose sight of who they are. Because if you as the principal have decided that the staff, 50 parents, that they are your audience, my advice always is you figure out the best way to talk to them in the most personal and close way. And for example, going on media isn't that. So crucially in any communications plan, it's always important to have clarity on who your key, key audiences, key, key stakeholders are, and what is the most personal and close way that you can communicate with them. So know your audience is the takeaway here on from you. Precisely. Thanks for that. We're now going to ask our participants to um, take part in an online poll. And uh, Sinead, um, when you get a chance there, you might put it up. It's a, a, a yes or no answer. Would you feel confident in dealing with the media in a crisis situation? So we're going to ask you all to participate um, in, in the poll. And um, if you're not sure, just you, use your gut. Um, it won't let you down your gut reaction. Well, if, can I jump in, David? If, if you're not yes, sure, well. the answer is definitely no. Oh, um, if you're not sure, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, if you could submit uh, your answer there, it would be great. And um, Owen, you can take a breath because um, we'll... Uh, uh, how are we doing there? Um, well, Maybe, yeah. that, that, that's, that, that, that's certainly... 81% not confident and 19% no. Owen, you seem to be relieved. <laughs> I am a little relieved. Uh, I'm a little relieved about that, David, because I think media, Why? well, I think media, even in the best of circumstances, even if it is the, the best news story, if, for example, your school has done something marvelous, I think in those situations, media should always be treated with the highest level of care and at times a little bit of suspicion. Um, because what you're doing and what we're doing when we go on media is we're dealing with the seasoned professional. And often people, not specifically just principals, um, but organizations, inexperienced amateurs go on media in a crisis, really not knowing what they're letting themselves in for at all and they don't really appreciate the scale of what they're letting themselves in for. So for example, um, people would often go on Morning Ireland without really understanding the scale. So to give you a sense of it, half a million people listen to Morning Ireland in the morning. And to give you a, a, a comparison or to provoke some thought in your head, were I to ask you to deliver a, a 10 minute presentation in an hour's time in the Phoenix Park to half a million people, you'd say, that's absolutely daft. I wouldn't have had enough time to get my thoughts straight. But that's what people do. People end up going on Morning Ireland without a huge amount of preparation, which is essentially the amount of people in Crow Park on All-Ireland All Day Sunday multiplied by six. So I think it should give you certainly a level of pause for thought. And if you don't decide not to do media, and I think that's certainly sometimes a wise choice, it only takes, if we go back to the Morning Ireland example, it only takes Morning Ireland five seconds to say, a person from school X was unavailable to comment. Now, that might be torturous. That might be a torturous five seconds, but it is far better than a torturous eight minutes where you are A, getting asked a whole lot of questions you hadn't considered, or B, you were saying things that then create more of a problem for you after. If you do decide to do media, what I would be always again suggesting and reminding you, which is a theme we have touched on already, which is who is my audience? Who am I talking to? What am I trying to achieve? And what are the obvious questions that I could get asked? Uh, Kipling, Rudyard Kipling had what he referred to as his six honest serving men, which were questions like what, why, when, how, where, and who. I think you have to think those through and dry run it, dry run it, dry run it. So the fact that about eight out of 10 people are feeling mildly uncomfortable or not prepared for media, I think that's a very sensible uh, position to be in because media should be treated with the level of respect it deserves. And it's a high risk situation and you'd need to have thought it through before you engage with them.
Wow, some food for thought there, on. We'll come back to you shortly. Um, Edel, we're just going to look at a scenario uh, that has been dealt with many times by the education team, and indeed yourself, uh, a member of staff is under investigation, or there's a rumour machine, or they've been charged with a criminal offence. What advice would you give to the chairperson of the board in relation to employment law obligations? And in particular, what circumstances would justify a suspension? I mean, um, the hard yeah. questions that are asked of, of you. And um, Yeah, the first question that's usually put to me in that type of a situation, uh, David, uh, is, you know, should we suspend the employee? That's typically, if, you know, if it's not the first, it's the second one. And, you know, this is where I urge caution uh, for the board in, in, in considering that question. And it is one that should be considered, but one, you know, just because the board has the ability to suspend doesn't mean that it should exercise uh, that, that, that power that it has to do so. There is instructive case law on this issue of suspension uh, by an employer in the workplace. And that's the Bank of Ireland, Riley and the Bank of Ireland High Court case. And in that case, it talked about suspension being necessary in certain circumstances. So that being where an investigation is necessary and that requiring that investigation requiring the removal of the employee from the workplace to enable that investigation to continue. It might be circumstances where the wrongdoing might continue if the employee is to remain in the workplace and not be suspended, or it might be deemed necessary to protect the reputation of the business. So they're kind of the key principles, another being actually the need to protect other employees. So they're the kind of considerations that the High Court described as being the, the, the guiding principles that should be looked to by any employer in determining whether or not the suspension of an employee is necessary. So, you know, uh, those should be looked to. Now, they, they, the disciplinary procedures empower schools to suspend, as do the child protection procedures. Um, but again, I would be urging a, a chair person who would inevitably would be this would fall to in terms of the suspension in the first instance to consider, well, what is the plan? Do you think it's necessary applying the guidelines that I've just set out? And what is the plan for that person coming back to to work? So, you know, um, it can't be indefinite. It has to be for a specific purpose and necessary in accordance with those guidelines. Um, Importantly, too, is the need to afford that employee the right to challenge the suspension. So if, for instance, the chairperson uh, initiates the emergency protocol and implements a suspension where under the child protection procedures, for instance, and it is then that the employee is then removed from the workplace using that protocol, it's important then that the employee be given an opportunity to challenge their continued suspension under those procedures, let's say if it's pending a disciplinary um, procedure, that it's important that the employee be afforded that right to challenge it, and you know that that would be heard by the board. Um, there are just some important, but you know, kind of a, a, a significant um, principles that must be adhered to. You you mentioned David about uh, you know instances of investigations. Uh, which might be criminal in nature, I think you, you, you mentioned yes, as well. Yes. So that is, you know, another or another most frequently asked question that I would come across would be, you know, should we be telling the guards about this, Adele? This has come to our attention, you know, whether by hearing this through the grapevine or perhaps uh, thinking of a case that I've advised on, a, an annual audit, being conducted by the school's accountants, which maybe showed potential misappropriation of school funds. Like in that situation, you know, the principal or the chairperson picks up the phone to me and says, listen, this has just come to light. Uh, the accountants have just flagged this, you know, flagged this possible an anomaly in our accounts. And this is a concern that we have, you know, should we be notifying the guards at this point? Now there is specific legislation that puts an onus on individuals and indeed boards of management to notify the Gardaí and that's the Criminal Justice Act of 2011 and in that act section 19 of that act it talks about somebody having 
knowing or believing that information that that person has, has might be of material assistance in the apprehension or prevention of a specific offence. And in the list of specific offences uh, are the offences of fraud and theft. So, for example, in that particular school where I was advising, they did have, uh, I would argue that they had information uh, they certainly had information by virtue of the auditor's report or the accountant's report that showed some anomaly and additional information. So, you know, without kind of the, the legislation is a little bit vague as to to what extent must you know or believe the information. You know, we didn't have a forensic accountant's report, for instance, in that case. But, you know, I think the safer thing to do in that instance is rather than kind of read between the lines or interpret the legislation and what that means i think the safer thing to do is to adopt adopt the the reporting stance uh, to the guardie in that particular scenario you know it, it, uh, I, I know there was a lot in that question and thanks for for netting the the issues uh, in it and i think our our uh, audience uh, will be very um, appreciative of, of that. I'm going to sort of move with the theme of what Bell was talking about back to Fergal there. Uh, Fergal, um, a, lo a, lo a lot of CBSMA members and schools are based in rural and provincial areas. Um, it's not to say that, that, that in city areas too, uh, there aren't issues, but in relation to the local and provincial media, I, I do think they're more connected uh, in provincial uh, and rural areas to the community. The chairperson of the board could be uh, manager of one of the football teams, know the local journalists well, uh, they have mobile numbers, they're actually friends. Um, how real is that pressure in, in, in a crisis situation, bearing in mind that some of the issues that Edel brought up there? Yeah, uh, that's very real, David, because uh, some of the issues that Edel brought up, you know, they can happen in any school uh, all over the country. And so there can be real pressure, uh, I suppose, on a school to comment. Um, and, uh, you know, in that scenario, you might assume the communication can, might be controlled through the initial channels of the school phone, i.e. secretary and principal. But in this case, in, in the case I'm thinking about, local media were very familiar with staff, uh, a national uh, journalist. It was a, a close colleague of the principal in a sporting context. So that adds a whole new layer of complexity to an issue. Now, I suppose the important action, you know, from the school's point of view is to initially brief staff on what they can say and can't say and you know that will be very limited probably no comment uh, and no one might comment on that but where there is a legal element also loose words could have important uh, ramifications so the communications around the crisis is important because if you have a strategy it can uh, perform a gate keeper function around uh, the comments as they emanate from the school. And I suppose, speaking of gatekeepers, your secretary is the person who will be answering the school po uh, phone. So it's most important that you have that conversation with them on, on, on how to deal with those phone calls. And the relationship between the principal and the school in general and the secretary really matters as they will be, uh, they can filter the information and yet keep you fully informed as to who's looking for the information. So the thing about it is in the midst of a crisis, David, school life still rumbles on and the normal phone calls will probably still be happening. Thanks for that, Fergal. And uh, on, on that, I'm going to come back to Owen because uh, the media have just been in touch uh, with, with the school and Fergal is on the other end of the line to you, and um, they're going to publish a story, uh, the, and the school is given a chance to refute the content or make a comment. Uh, why not refute the comment, or uh, this story? Um, well, I think there's a, there's a few things to, 
there's a few things to unpick from that, David. To build on what Fergal talked about, the, that line of loose lips sink ships, I think is an absolutely good policy to work through. And that anything you say to a journalist could be used in evidence against you. And I think the idea that the school secretary is briefed, but not just briefed to be a gatekeeper, briefed to be a question asker of finding out what the journalist wanted to speak about and all of that, I think is useful. I think it's also useful for people to know that there is a myth around dealing with the media around speed. Um, people think that there are prizes for speed of response. There isn't. And media will use urgency as a tool against you. So, for example, we hear it regularly. My deadline is this afternoon. I need a quote from you. We're going to run a story. To which essentially you're saying, that's great. That's your deadline. That's not my deadline. So it's worth remembering anyway that fast actions are always risky actions. And I would much prefer people on this call to be criticized for being slow and correct rather than fast and wrong. So a crisis can get the adrenaline going and it can make us kind of make significant communications decisions, which in, in the review turn out to be wrong, like talking to a journalist too soon. So regarding kind of dealing with media in a crisis, I would suggest that people remember this, which is don't just do something, stand there. Now that's the opposite to what we would typically hear in a crisis, which is don't just, do, don't just stand there, do something. Well, what I'm advising people to do is don't just do something, stand there, because you don't want to exacerbate a crisis and they tend to be exacerbated when people rush into action. Because you'll find that you're gonna be plagued with people saying, you know, we have to get our story out there. We have to get our side of the story out there whereas I would be suggesting you don't. And to give you a very quick example, uh, we, as I mentioned, or I may have not have mentioned it, we were brought in by the Department of Education late last year to support them around the communications with the issues around the algorithm. I'm able to talk a little bit about it because the newspapers covered it. But the minister found out the middle of one week, yet didn't speak publicly about it until the following week. You would say, why? Well, first of all, the reason why was the answers to the obvious questions were not available when she found out, i.e., how did it happen? How many students were affected? What does it mean for them? What does it mean for their CAO? What does it mean for their current course? What are you going to do to make it right? None of those questions were available when they found out immediately. Now, obviously, there was an element of communication with other stakeholders, but rather than going straight to media, because they were the obvious questions that we media would ask. So again, you prep, you get everything lined up, you figure out when is the best time to go and do you have the answers to the obvious questions. And the line that I, I love using, which is a line by Ricky Roma, and Ricky Roma was a character in the famous play and movie Glengarry Glen Ross. Al Pacino played his character in the movie and he said, you never open your mouth until you know what the shot is. That principle of don't say anything until you know for sure and where possible, don't allow urgency to be used against you, I think is very, very important. To parse then the question that you asked, David, on whether or not you should answer a question or whether or not you should respond, I think it's worth noting as well that in the context of a media issue, media tend to contact you for two sets of circumstances. The first set is they are running the story anyway and have invited you to engage. And the second is media tell you that they're running the story but they need you to engage. And those are two very different things. If it's the first where they decided they're gonna run it, you have to ask yourself, will my utterances make this any better? So for example, if you have been accused of something or the school has been accused of something that you can totally disprove, I would suggest naturally enough you would speak. But it's also worth considering where is the story in its cycle? So for example, people who consume media would know stories tend to follow a cycle of it depending on the type but normally it's no longer than a week three or four days the mistake people make is they talk towards the end of the cycle which breathes fire into it so if for example you're figuring well we're three days into this you may be best just to say nothing and let it fizzle out and then you have to ask yourself the question anyway which is what we should always ask ourselves i suspect was is what i'm going to say make this making this any better and how well prepared am i you would think that is a very obvious thing to say, but as I touched on earlier, we have been brought into situations where people have gone on to Morning Ireland with 20 minutes preparation without having the most uh, obvious answers uh, figured out to the most obvious questions. So I think it's always worth considering, David, can I disprove what is being put to me? If you can, talk. Ask yourself, can I make this better? Am I well enough prepared? 
and where is it in the cycle? And then very briefly on the second context though, where they may need you to make their story. So therefore by engaging, you create it rather than ignoring it and letting fizzle out. I think it's worth figuring that out as well. Because for example, there was a, another school, Ian and I, you know, Hurley he and I were working with who were trending for all of the wrong reasons on Twitter. It hadn't made it to the traditional media yet, but journalists were calling for comment. The reason why it hadn't made it to traditional media was because the journalists couldn't report on it because what was being said online was unverified and unverified accusations. However, by commenting or denying the, com the comments online, our client would have given, given the journalist the quote to use. So therefore it feeds the story. So you always have to be asking, what's the value in this? Where am I at? And how much information does the journalist have? And will they be able to run the story? So I think engaging with media really needs to be thought carefully through. And I think you, that element on how will I make this better is always a good question. So caution all around their own and, and indeed from Fergal there earlier. You talked about traditional media, their own. Fergal, I'm back to you about social media. And you and your colleagues on the CPSMA helpline, uh, you support school leaders in all sorts uh, of ways. Social media must be uh, high on the list of sort of um, calls and requests you get. Yeah, David, it's, it's certainly become a, a, a complicating factor, I suppose. I, I think the first thing is it's important for school personnel not to engage with social media sites around a particular issue if it has a reason in your school. Uh, because I think if a member of a board or a teacher or staff member engages with a site, uh, then, you know, they could become the de facto communications person, and that might not be helpful for the school, it might not have been intended. So even engaging with, uh, with social media sites critically and contesting information that they may have said about your school, uh, it probably only adds fuel to the story and maybe just adds more pressure to the school as well. Um, and I think it's important to know also that journalists might troll the social media site. Uh, so if you engage, they might quote you as school personnel. So um, I suppose at this juncture, it might be opportune for uh, teachers to familiarize yourselves or with themselves with the uh, teaching council guidelines on engaging with social media uh, to fully inform themselves of the do's and don'ts uh, at this point. And a link uh, to this document is also available uh, on our website on our news section. And Fergal, those guidelines were only introduced in February or published uh, th this year. So again, for a board of management meeting or a staff meeting, I think it would be well worthwhile to take them out and discuss. Edel, social media issues come across your dis desk uh, and of course across the desk uh, of our colleagues uh, in Mason Hayes and Kern. What type of issues do you have to deal with? Um. The most common, the most common social media issues relate to parents who are making negative posts or criticisms, either of the school or of a particular teacher in the school. And, you know, faced with that situation, uh, the school contacts ourselves looking for advice on how to address it. Now, the, the first thing that a principal or a chairperson might say to me is, you know, uh, you know, send them a lawyer's letter, basically a cease and desist for, you know, using right. the, the full legal phrase, you know, uh, and demanding that if they don't take this down within X amount of time, we're going to do X, Y, Z, you know. I've never sent a letter like that, I should say. Um, what I have had, uh, touch wood, what I've had success with in terms of an approach would be... Um, a, a, an approach that starts with the school uh, and that being engaging with the parents directly by way of letter, uh, simply stating the fact that the postings have come to your attention, that, that they are, or the content of them is a cause of concern and that the, the, that the subject matter of the content, if this is applicable, is better dealt with under the parental complaints procedure you enclose a copy of the printed complaints procedure and you 
urge them to engage with you on that basis or engage with the teacher, whoever it is, uh, under, the, under the applicable stage of the procedures. And that is the first port of call in terms of it. I mean, separately, I would always advise the principal to make contact with the social media site directly with the view to having the post removed. Now, I think nine times out of 10, it isn't removed because what they consider to be fair comment or, you know, is, is pretty, there's a pretty broad definition of that from just from my own experience of it. And we're, we're talking about the need for a posting to be pretty extreme for it to be deemed worthy of removal by any of these social media sites. But I think particularly if it's, you know, a post relating to a member of staff, it goes a long way for a principal or a chairperson to say, well, here's a copy of the letter or email that I sent to Facebook, or here's the steps that I took using their reporting policy or tool to get this thing removed. So this is what I've done, uh, but here's what I also did. I wrote to the parents directly and I asked them to do this. So that's, um, that is how to date we've had best experience in having, in having these issues resolved. Um, and, you know, it is the case that schools then, you know, kind of, they kind of become transfixed with how many people are liking these negative posts. Look at the other parents who are commenting on it. Whereas, you know, like Fergal was saying, not to engage or use the social media site or platform as a tool to engage, but rather to bring it back to the school's own policies. What do we have within, you know, our toolbox in terms of dealing with these particular issues and to write to the parents in that regard and that has had success now it might take a second letter a reminder letter um in terms of you know i don't think you heard me the first time here you know i you know reconsider your position and i i won't you know i trust i won't need to take any further action it's worked so far really like the idea of the parent complaints procedure rather than whatsapp to, to deal with the situation at school. Well done on that, Idel. Uh, I'm going to come back to you. I'm conscious we're running out of time, unfortunately. On social media, you're not getting away uh, lightly, just communications clinic, you deal with it. So you, you, you might comment on that and, and do a wrap up for us. And then I'll come back to Fergal for the final wrap up. So thanks, Owen. Certainly, I think very briefly on social media, it's worth even for your own interest uh, to watch how social media works. It tends to burn very brightly for a day or so, and then the fire starts to go out around day three. That's useful to even tell staff on that's where we're at, and that's why we're approaching, uh, perhaps as for, to build on what Fergal said, uh, a silence around uh, social media, because it is a little tricky to manage, where at least a newspaper or publication has standards that it has to follow, whereas really on social, anybody anywhere can say anything about you. So uh, to build on what Fergal has said, the idea of letting it lie is certainly sensible. And then Adele's point, which we have seen through our work with Mason Mason Curran, working very well of actually contacting the person directly uh, and asking them to take it down works superbly. So I think they are worthwhile while exercises uh, for people to reflect on and do. I would take it as a given, as an aside, that all schools have some form of a social media plan or certainly are in um, the plan to develop it because I know that TikTok in particular is very popular within a number of the age brackets that are within primary schools. So it is worth reflecting on, do we have a policy around those elements? Final comments from me really are, have a plan and have thought it through and have, have figured out your team. Never forget your key stakeholders. They are the key people. They are the school family. They are always your priority. Therefore, link to that, media is not your friend. They have a job to do and they will use you. So don't ever allow yourself to be rushed. As touched on the social media storm, watch it. It tends to burn out after about three or so days. But really crucially for me in a crisis, whatever the crisis is, if it's back to crisis one, the buckets that that bucket that we can manage or the buckets that we can't never believe that the commu communication stops when the crisis ends. The crisis is the acute focus problem. What you need to then develop is a plan for communications after it. Often a rebuilding needs to happen or a rebuilding of relationships, uh, a rebuilding of trust, a rehealing. So I would be advising people to certainly you have to have developed 
a plan for after the crisis, whatever it may be. Well done, Owen. And Fergal, and Fergal Gerin up there uh, to you. Uh, yeah, well, I, I suppose the thing about it is, David, is that the events that we've spoken about, thankfully, are still quite rare, but they are stressful, they take their toll, and I suppose just to let our audience know that there is employee assistance available for schools in the form of Spectrum Life, there's a link uh, to that on the news section of our website as well, and in the event that a problem arises or you do have that crisis, please ring us in the CPSMA office and of course we will assist you in whatever way we can. Um, I suppose in my own experience, the most important aspect that you can give to your school community uh, as a school leader is the element that nowadays we have so little of, which is time. Uh, an emergency to one staff member or individual might not be an emergency to you. But if you give people with concerns and difficulties time, if that's the culture in your school where people are heard and listened to, it will help to make the bigger crisis easier to respond to because um, you'll have built that trust. And that is really important in terms of resilience going forward. Um, I, I think it was George Bernard Shaw, just in terms of communication, the last quote is that um, the single, he said that the single biggest problem with communication is that people don't know that it has taken place. And I myself have often left meetings, sent newsletters, uh, sent memos, and I've been fully convinced that people are now fully briefed and probably congratulated myself on my communication, only to find that, in fact, people have interpreted three or four different ways. So I would say, look at the messages you send, uh, get points of views, uh, build your relationships now and know your team. Uh, give people that time that they need and you'll be in a much better place to communicate and act if something happens. Fergal, on that note, uh, Idel Anon, thanks so much for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us this afternoon. And to all our participants, thanks for um, uh, participating in the online poll. And um, it remains for me to say, well, if we can help you in any way to Mason, Hayes and Kern, to the uh, offices of CPSMA, or to OWN and the communications clinic, please do feel uh, free to contact us. And uh, we'd like to wish you um, all the best for the remaining term, a crisis-free term, hopefully, and for the brighter days ahead. Sláin agus